Let's stand together now, and uh, if you would, please turn in your Bible uh, at this time to the book of Acts, chapter 8, and uh, we're going to move right into the message for the sake of time this evening, and uh, I uh, don't intend to be long in the message, but I want to be a blessing, and I want to teach you some principles tonight on how to witness to a stranger, and uh, we're going to be looking in the next several weeks at how to witness to different people. We're going to learn how to witness to a relative, how to witness to a co-worker, and uh, just how can we be the witness that God would have us to be. And in Acts chapter 8, we see one of the great soul-winning stories of the New Testament. And uh, we've read this over the years, but I want you to read with me Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 38, uh, the story here of of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, who was a deacon from the church at Jerusalem, who was obedient to the leadership of the Lord. And so let's read about it. Verse 26, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, a Rise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia and eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship who was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found Azotus, and passing through, preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful time of testimony and music. We ask in the final moments now as we open your holy word that you would speak to us about how to witness for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, for the next few weeks, we're going to be learning about the importance of witnessing. You say, well, pastor, isn't that kind of just a common thing at Lancaster Baptist Church? I don't believe we can ever assume that anything is just commonly working. I think that every area that is important in the Christian life needs to be stressed, and we need to be reminded about the importance of these things, and in particular tonight, the importance of soul winning or witnessing. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we know the story, the Lord Jesus Christ has a sin it up to heaven, and we know that there is a commission that is given. The Bible says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the <coughs> uttermost part of the earth. Now, everybody knows that a Christian is to be a witness. In fact, I believe sometimes unsaved people are surprised when we don't witness to them and when we don't talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Christian knows that it's the will of God. How many of you believe that it's God's will that men and women everywhere would be saved? The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Some people say, I just don't believe in a God that would want people to go to hell. And I like to remind them, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 20 and 21, Jesus said unto his disciples, peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me 
even so send I you. A great pastor from last century, an author and a one that wrote many gospel tracts, Leighton Ford once said, we are to evangelize not because it is easy, not because we may be successful, but because Christ has called us. He is our Lord. We have no other choice but to obey him. How many of you tonight believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord? He is our Savior, but He is our Lord. He is our Master. And He has said to us that we are to go into all the world. Now, the Apostle Paul himself, who we spoke about even tonight, uh, in particular, we think of his ministry to the Ephesians and uh, the great revival that took place and how so many pagans were saved that the business of making gods uh, fell down and how that there was even a riot in Ephesus and how Paul left for his safety. And it was to the city of Ephesus that uh, he preached and mightily ministered for two years. But in Ephesians 6 and verse 18, he said this, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching the thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, listen to this now, and for me, he said, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, how many of you would agree with me tonight that if Paul needed prayer to be bold, then we need to pray for one another this week that we will open our mouth to give the gospel? Sometimes people say, well, you know, the Apostle Paul, he was just so bold, and pastor, that's just what you do. Can I just remind you that no one has real Holy Spirit boldness unless there is prayer, unless there is seeking the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. And Paul the Apostle said, pray for me that I might have boldness. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes it's intimidating to witness. Sometimes it's intimidating to open up a conversation about the things of God. I don't know why that is. We talk about so many other things, but sometimes the devil throws a roadblock at us when it comes to telling others about Jesus Christ. Tonight, I just want to give you three simple principles that I hope you can take and use this week. Principles that will help us with talking to someone that maybe we don't really know that well. They're not a relative. They're not a neighbor. They've, they're not someone we've had a lot of conversation with. How can we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that are strange to us? We don't know their family. We don't know their tradition. How can we get the gospel to them? If you're taking notes, I want to give you three principles tonight. Number one, number one, we must allow God to lead. We must allow God to lead. We must say tonight, Lord, I want you to take and provide the leadership. I'm taking the hands off of the steering wheel of my life. I want you to lead me to whom you want me to witness to. I want you to take the leadership. Now notice this in verse 26, the Bible says, and the angel of the Lord spake to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Verse 27, and he arose and he went, and he arose and went. Let's say that together. And he arose and went. Uh, The Bible teaches us, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the spirit. Here we see a man that heard the call of God. Philip was called to go to the desert place called Gaza. How many of you understand that if you were called to go there today, you might have some fear in your heart to go to the place called Gaza? I've been into the area around uh, Bethlehem. I've been to the city of Hebron. There's a sign right outside the city of Hebron that says, enter this city at the risk of your own life. And uh, there's a lot of tension there today. I remember going into Bethlehem and all the soldiers. It wasn't the little reflective Christmas nativity scene that I was expecting. Uh, It was a place of tension. Uh, And here for Philip, while it may not have been as dangerous as it is today, it was not what he had planned for that day. Uh, It was not necessarily his idea to go to Gaza, but it was the idea of God to send him as a saved deacon from the church at Jerusalem to go to a man who was searching, to go to a man who needed to hear the gospel. 
Now, it is not likely that we will have the angel of the Lord directing us. The angel of the Lord, as we read in the Word of God, is a theophany of the Lord Jesus Christ personally coming to Philip and directing him to go to Gaza. But it is very likely that any of us that say to the Lord, Lord, lead me, Lord, show me where to go, that we will be led. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now then, as a believer, uh, I have a GPS system in my life, if you will. I have leadership provided to me and direction provided to me by none other than the Holy Spirit of God. But what good is that leadership if I'm not acknowledging that leadership? What good is the leadership of the Holy Spirit if I do not listen to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit? And so while it may seem very simple, it is yet very profound, this fact, that we must allow God to lead. We must say, Lord, if you want me to talk to that person in the parking lot, if you want me to speak to that person on the, on the shuttle bus or whatever the case might be, Lord, I'll do what you lay on my heart. I will obey every impulse of the Holy Spirit. I will obey you today, Lord, as Philip of old. And so it was that he heard the call and that he was led of the Spirit. Now, what we need tonight are men and women who are easily led by the Holy Spirit. Spirit, people that will obey the impulse of the Holy Spirit. Notice in verse 28, this Philip, it says, as he was uh, going along on his journey, the Bible tells us, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot, speaking of the Ethiopian, uh, and reading Isaiah the prophet. Now here we see Philip was led to the Ethiopian, and, and we notice something very, very important here, that not only did Philip follow the leadership of God, but in doing so, he was led to someone that was being prepared for by God. Now, folks, you say, this sounds a little mystical. No, this sounds like God. God wants us to be sensitive to him. When we are, he will lead us in a direction. And when he leads us in that direction, he often is going to lead us to someone upon whose heart he has already been working. So it's, it's amazing, but not with our God. This is how he works. That when Philip was in tune with the Holy Spirit, and when Philip followed the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he went right to an individual who was reading something from the Bible that he did not understand. Now, one of the things that amazes me as Paul was uh, on that missionary journey and spending time uh, in uh, Miletus before he was to go back uh, ultimately to Jerusalem, uh, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 20 that he was speaking to the elders there, and he said, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, Acts 20, 22, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. Now listen to that phrase for just a moment. The Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. Let's say that together. The Holy Ghost now, now please understand, I'm not the soul winner, you're not the soul winner, the Holy Ghost is the one that's witnessing in every city. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that's touching hearts. And so, uh, Brother Rule and Brother Hauk, you guys help me here if you would for just a second and just come right on up here. And let's just illustrate this for just a moment because uh, I'm going to have Brother Rule, you come on this side, Brother Hauk, you'll be on this side. Brother Rule is going to be Philip for just a moment and, and, and who knows what he has a plan for his day. Maybe he's going to get his chariot washed. Maybe he's going to uh, go, go look at the temple and take some pictures of it. Or, now, who knows what Philip had on his mind, but the Lord put on his heart, I want you to go down to Gaza. It's out of your way. It's hot. It's dusty. Uh, but there's someone there that I want you to go talk to. I, I suppose, as, as Philip went, uh, that he was in awe, that he was perhaps unsure about who he would meet and what he would see. But the same Holy Spirit that told him to go has been already working in his heart. And what I want you to realize is the Bible says the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. This is what I believe from that text. I believe there are people right now in Palmdale and in Lancaster and the Holy Ghost is touching their heart right now. 
I actually believe there are people, as I preach tonight in this church house, who are in their home and perhaps wondering about God, wondering about how can they get help for their family, wondering about the veracity of Scripture. There's a a million different ways that they could be having these thoughts. Maybe some Jehovah Witness knocked on their door and they they thought, this looks crazy, but what is the truth? And and, 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 and in all these different ways, God's Holy Spirit is working and, and preparing hearts. The problem then is not that God is not witnessing in the hearts of men. The problem is that when he speaks to his people about going in that direction, just getting in the flow of that direction, that we do not heed to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. You say, well, what will that feel like? I can't describe it exactly, but I'll tell you, there will come a sense upon you. Let me say this to you. The devil's never going to touch your heart to tell somebody about Jesus. There will come a burden upon your heart, and we must allow God to lead. Philip heard the call. Philip was led by the Holy Spirit, and we don't know what we're entering into. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. We don't know who maybe has planted already in his heart. I did not know that Brother Larry Knight had already been speaking uh, to Julian about the Lord and had already laid so much seed into the lives of this couple. But when God put on my heart to invite them to coffee and to talk to them, I didn't know exactly. I just know God put on my heart to say to them, why don't we have coffee together this week? I did not know that the Holy Ghost had already been working in their heart. But that's the way God seems to put these things together. And unless we're willing to ask somebody to coffee or speak to them or invite them to Happiness Is Sunday, then we'll never see the fruition of what God is trying to do. So point number one, we must allow God to lead. And it's so important that we would say, Lord, I'm not the captain of my life anymore. You're the Lord, and I want to do what you want me to do. And isn't it amazing that this Ethiopian was seated in his chariot And he's reading from Isaiah, and he's reading Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Oh, listen, Philip heard the call. Philip was led by the Holy Spirit, and Philip did not hesitate to go. Thank you, man. You can be seated. Look at verse 29. The Bible says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Let's say that together. And Philip... Now, here we see Philip has already started in the direction of the Ethiopian. But now now then the Lord is verifying. Now then the Lord is speaking. And Philip sees the Ethiopian, and he goes to him. And by the way, can I just remind you tonight, it should be very obvious in the text, but when you study the Bible, you'll find there's no discrimination, there's no racialism, there's no uh, judgmentalism. We don't see Philip saying, hey, I don't go to that kind of a person. It didn't matter that he was an Ethiopian. It didn't matter that he was a, had a government job. What mattered is that God told him to go. And may we not ever have the attitude that we'll go to some people but not to other people. May I remind you tonight that every soul is precious to God, red and yellow, black, brown, and white. They're all precious in his sight. And Philip was sent to go to the Ethiopian and to tell this man about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he was told, he ran. He immediately obeyed God. I've been reading a book given to me by a dear friend a few months ago called A Quest for Souls. A Quest for Souls by George Truitt. George Truitt built the First Baptist Church up until over 4,000 in attendance every Sunday. It was one of the largest Baptist churches in America. And Truitt asked a question in the book. And he said this, he said, Where is the faith that claims the hardened sinner for Christ? Where is the faith that claims a hardened sinner for Christ? Don't ever have somebody in your list that you say, well, they'll never get saved. Have faith in God. And I believe Philip had faith in God when he went to Gaza and when he saw the Ethiopian and he ran to the Ethiopian. His heart was filled with faith. If you leave this auditorium tonight thinking, well, people don't get saved that way anymore. And that guy that I work with, I already know he's a, he's a Satanist. He doesn't want to hear it. If you have that attitude, my friend, he likely will not be saved. But if you have the attitude and the belief 
that God can do anything, and with God all things are possible. It is amazing what God will do in the heart of a faith-filled soul winner. Oh, Philip could have been intimidated by the Ethiopian eunuch's entourage. He could have been intimidated by the fact that he represented the queen of Ethiopia. Nevertheless, God had told him to go. And I want to say something tonight. Don't be intimidated. It doesn't matter who the boss is at work. It doesn't matter how much education they have. When God speaks to your heart, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so we see here tonight, very simply, we must allow God to lead. Now, how many of you would say tonight, don't raise your hand, I am willing to let God lead me this week? There's no way you're going to have a person seated with you next week if you would not let God lead you to invite them. We must be willing to allow God to lead. Now, I I can't create that moment. We have soul winning and we have planned evangelism, and that's wonderful. But the moment that I'm speaking to you about is a God-ordained moment. How many of you are sensing that? This, this Philip Ethiopian unit, if you haven't figured it out by now, God created that moment. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ himself says, hey, excuse me, Philip, I don't want you to wash your chariot today. I want you to go down to someone who has their own chariot. I want you to go down to Gaza. I mean, it, he just had to be available and willing to go. Allow God to lead. Secondly, the second principle that I want to teach you tonight is this. Learn how to ask the right questions. Learn how to ask the right question. Now notice this, very simple in verse 30. Philip ran thither to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Now, we sometimes are very timid about engaging in a conversation. What is amazing to me is that the man says, well, how can I accept someone show me? Do you understand that this Ethiopian was literally waiting for someone to help him? Do you understand that not far from here tonight, in a rest home, is someone waiting for us to tell them? And not far from here tonight, in the veterans' home, is someone waiting for us to tell them? And not far from here tonight at Plant 42 is someone waiting for us to tell them. And not far from here tonight in your workplace is someone that is waiting for us to tell them. And he said, how can I know except some man show me? Now friends, tonight, you and I are here because someone showed us. Now it's our turn. Now is our time. And I see a wonderful presentation here because Philip says, understandest thou what thou readest? Philip didn't say, well, I know what that's saying. Let me tell you. He asks a question. Now let me tell you about questions. Questions stimulate the heart. Questions stimulate the conscience. An accusation hardens the will. You're never going to argue someone into heaven. You're never going to argue them into salvation. But when you ask them, do you understand what you are reading? You begin to stimulate thought within them. May I share with you tonight a few questions that you could ask in this type of conversation just to get the conversation going. Here's one. Have you ever wondered if God could help you with this situation you're facing? It's not uncommon at work for someone to tell you about a marital problem. It's not uncommon for someone to tell you about a financial problem. Rather than do what the Pharisees would do and say, well, you're probably having that problem because you've been so disobedient to God. Rather than accusing, may I propose that you ask a question. Do you believe God could have a plan in this? The answer might be, well, I suppose he could. You might say, could I show you a few things that I've learned that might help you? You go from a question to another question. Can I tell you about something that I believe would give perspective? We're going to learn about how to have happiness in the midst of trials. It's going to be something special at our church this week. But it begins with asking a question. Here's another question. Have you ever considered that God has a special plan for your life? Have you ever thought that God may be using this to help you for something later in your life? A simple question. Another question, if you were to die today, 
Do you know for sure that heaven would be your home? How many of you know that almost every day we open the newspaper and someone else has died? Almost every single day we read about this. It's a millionaire. It's a former president. It's someone. These are opportunities to talk about eternity and to simply ask someone, have you ever thought about where you might spend eternity? Here's a question. Have you considered God's will in this matter? Here's a question. Do you believe that God has something good that can come out of this? I remember going out soul winning many years ago with my daughter, Danielle, on a Saturday morning. And we went to a man's house, and, and uh, as we walked into the house, he and his wife were there, and, and she had been saved prior, but she had come with her husband who was not saved, and we sat down, we had some small talk, and, and then I asked this gentleman this question. I said, can I just ask you, do you know for sure that if your life ended today that you would spend eternity in heaven? And this is what he said to me. He said, you asked that question last Sunday, and I've been thinking about it every day since. Questions stimulate the conscience. Questions stimulate the heart. Here we see Philip just asking a question. Do you understand what you are reading? Questions stimulate the heart. And then secondly, be ready with an answer. Notice in verse 31, the Bible says, and he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. Now, sometimes we get the idea, they don't want to hear from me. They don't want to talk with me. Look at how tattooed they are. Look at how rough they are. Listen to how they cuss. The last thing he wants to do is talk to me about God, and yet it was the very thing the Ethiopian wanted. He wanted somebody to talk to him about God. And so the answer was to be given. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3 and 15, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh a reason of the hope that is within you. So three simple thoughts tonight. Thought number one, allow God to lead. Let's say that together. Allow. Lord, if you burden my heart this week, just show me the person and I'll be your servant. I'll, just, I'll go that direction. You might go with sweaty palms. You might go with an uncertain heart. But you're going to go when the Lord tells you to go. Allow God to lead. Secondly, ask the question. Ask any question. Ask a question that will help direct the conversation toward the things of God. And then thirdly, thirdly, answer according to the Scriptures. Answer according to the Scriptures. Now, for the sake of time, I want you to see just one verse here, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Let's read that together, shall we? Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now this man had been studying Isaiah. And you might come across somebody that's studying some other passage, or they're wondering about creation, or they're wondering about the resurrection, or they're having some question. And this is why we have preaching, and why we have devotions, and why we have classes, so that we can gain some scriptural repertoire, so that when someone asks, we might be able to give them the answer. And if we don't have the answer, we can go back to the Bible and search it out and bring it to them the next day. By the way, you don't have to be a theologian to be a soul winner. It, there's nothing wrong with telling someone, you know, I don't know that I have the answer to that, but I'll get it right away for you that you would care about somebody enough to find the answer to their question. And he begins preaching Christ. He preaches that Christ is the Lamb of God. He preaches that Christ is the Son of God. And what happens? What happens when Christ is preached? What happens when people hear the gospel? Then we see that there's an opportunity for them to be saved. And, you know, I give an invitation at every service, and if someone does not come forward, that doesn't mean that I have failed. It doesn't mean that the gospel has failed. It may mean that somebody was disobedient to the call of God. But it's not my job to save them. It is simply my job to get the gospel out out so that they can be saved. And this man was truly saved. We see in the scriptures, the Bible tells us in verse 36, as they went on their way, they came into the water and the eunuch said, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. 
You see, this man had heard the preaching about Isaiah. It came to fruition in his heart. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He had, he had seen some people getting baptized over uh, at Pentecost in Jerusalem. He had seen these people's lives change. He was reading in Isaiah about Jesus, but now he had heard the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so he gives a statement of faith. And by the way, before anyone's ever baptized, they must give a statement of faith. And then he is baptized to show that he did believe in God. And so three simple steps tonight. Number one, Allow God to lead. Let's say that together. Allow God to lead. Number two, ask the person the right question. Ask the person the right question. Let's say that. Ask the person the right question. And number three, answer according to the scripture. Allow God to lead. Then ask the right question. And then answer according to the scripture. Very simple, but this is what God did in bringing the Ethiopian to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We were on the island of Rhodes a few days ago, and we had toured uh, St. Paul's Bay where Paul had come, and it was believed he spent about a week there. And uh, then we came back and had a little free time to have a bite to eat, and, and uh, I forget exactly what Terry was doing, probably searching for Nutella, I'm not sure, but... I was standing there, and we were standing in kind of a little shopping area and, and, uh, with a couple of the men. And, and so we were just, just kind of waiting and getting ready for the next leg of the journey. And there was a man sitting in a chair next to one of the shops, and he looked at my ring. I wear a West Coast Baptist College ring, and uh, this, uh, this ring was given to me, and some of the college administrators have it. And on this ring, there's a cross. And, uh, and so the man looked at the ring, and he pointed at his hand. He said, I, ha I have a ring like that. And he said, I found it in the ocean. And it was the high school ring of some tourist that had gone over there and had lost his ring. So he was asking me, what is this ring? And how do I find who had this ring? And, and how, how, do, how do I get it back to them? And it seemed like it was something that burdened his heart. So I looked at the ring, and it was still in pretty good shape. I found the name of the guy's high school, found out the high school was in Seattle, Washington, and told him how to Google it, and told him how he could, how he could uh, maybe get a hold of the people at that school and maybe get the ring back. And, and as he looked at my ring, he saw the cross, and he said something to me. No one's ever said this to me before. He said, I want you to give me a blessing. I want you to give me a blessing. As you know, the Greek Orthodox Church is very dominant there in that part of the world. Very similar to Roman Catholicism. They broke off of Catholicism over the subject of baptism by immersion. They had that much right, but carried in much of the other false doctrine as well. And this man, in this little area of shops, a jeweler, he was a jeweler, he said to me, I want you to give me a blessing. And I said, oh, I can't give you a blessing. I can't do that. I said, there's only one that can give you a blessing. There's only one that can bless your life. And it's not me. And it's not the Greek Orthodox Church. And it's not any church. I said, the only one that can forgive our sin and bless our life and give us a home in heaven is Jesus Christ. He said, oh, he said, I need a blessing. I said, oh, listen, you, you need more than a blessing. There's, there's a great blessing that God has for you, but it's only found through Jesus Christ. And uh, he said, well, I want to know about that blessing. And I was able to open up, just on my phone there, the gospel. And I began to share with this man the gospel of Jesus Christ and how Jesus came to give the greatest blessing of all, how he shed his blood, how, how he rose again, how that through him we can have the blessedness of a Christian life and a home in heaven the man's name was Johannes. I think I have a picture of him. And uh, about an hour later, Johannes prayed and accepted Christ as his Savior. You see, what I'm trying to say is this. God had been working on his heart. It seemed like he had some conviction about owning that ring. He may have been under conviction about keeping that ring. He knew he needed God's blessing he thought that maybe as a pastor I could give him. There was, but there was a searching heart. But, but there also had to be someone that would obey the leading of the Lord. The Lord was opening a door for me. 
the Lord was giving me an opportunity to tell Johannes how he could have a blessing through Jesus Christ. But I, I had to begin my day that day saying, Lord, lead me. Lord, you show me, I will follow. And what I'm saying is when you take God and God's work in your heart and combine it with the fact that someone in Rhodes, Greece was prepared by God and sitting outside and waiting until a Baptist preacher would come to his little shop. Don't tell me that we don't serve a great God. And I just know that there's somebody in your domain this week. There's somebody and there's something going on in their heart. And they're searching. But we've got to be willing to allow the Lord to lead us. And we've got to be willing to ask them the right question and give them the right answer. And in many cases, just simply ask them to be the one that would come and sit with us and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and hear the music of the choir and the orchestra and, and experience the happiness we spoke about this morning and see that there's something in being saved that, that alcohol or drugs could never give to them. But it all begins with our following after the Lord. We are to evangelize not because it's easy, not because we may be successful, but because Christ has called us. And so I challenge you this week, allow God to lead. Ask the right question at the right time and be ready to give the right answer that God would have you to give.